Grace and peace be with you in the name of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to the Lord's Day Worship at Amphill Presbyterian Church. Um, the hunger offering sign-up sheet is making its way around. Um, and if you feel called to a particular date on there, go ahead and add your name. Help Mary Jane get the get the hunger offering slots filled up. <laughs> So she can sleep easy at but night. But you and I have done this so far. <laughs> um, so it's still a little bit soggy outdoors. So thanks for being flexible on where we sit um, as we worship this morning. Um, are there any announcements that you guys know of that need to be lifted up for? We should probably say Peter remaining got good news. So yes. okay. yeah. Seems good. Praise be to God. Continued prayers for health and happiness throughout that that journey. Yeah, and any other um, joys or prayer requests this morning? I want to lift up on behalf of um, one of my associates within the the Presbytery, I got the very sad news from Fred Holbrook this morning um, that the, the Reverend Shannon O'Leary was was out walking her dog or taking a walk and, and was hit and killed by a hit and run driver. Um, her husband is also a pastor in Presbytery. They had two children ages 10 and 13. She's behind and just just a, a tragedy that um, demands demands prayers and, and comfort. And, um, so be thinking of, of her family and Andy Myers, her husband, and their two children um, and all of their friends. They were the, Their children, I think, are at Three Chopped Presbyterian Church at that time. I think she may have preached here one time before because I remember yeah. Andy Myers twice, yeah. Or she preached one time and her husband did one time. Uh, well, I feel like y'all have filled our pulpit before. Yeah. Let's see. Well, that's that's it that I have for pronouncements and updates. Uh, um, just you, wondering if you did buy a lily. I mean, they're starting to get a little weepy. If you want to take yours home to plant or whatever, they will come back up if you plant them in your yard. So if you bought one, feel free to take one. And the belated happy birthday to Re, an upcoming one to, to Amy and, and Stacy Selden the next day. So thinking of you guys and glad that you are born. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. It's all in you. <laughs> well, friends, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God this morning. <laughs>
And now I invite us all to rise, whether in body or simply in spirit, as we call ourselves to worship the words of the 98th Psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His, his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Let, Let us worship God. God. Our opening hymn, Christ is Alive, number 312. <laughs> Remember the disciples in the upper room, locked away in fear, and Jesus appeared to them. When we keep our faults and failures locked safely away, we have no need to confess. But when God comes into our hearts, when we least expect, so we can be filled with forgiveness, with hope, with peace. Then we must confess trusting that the presence of God is here to announce our salvation, our forgiveness. So please join me as we pray, saying, God of empty tombs and empty people, when we hesitate to speak of your hope, forgive us and give us voice. When we find it difficult to love another, forgive us and give us new compassion. When we want to stand with the high and mighty, forgive us and put us next to the poor and the oppressed. When we stay locked behind our fears and doubts, forgive us and send us out to share your grace when we cannot believe your word of new life. Forgive us and fill us with your joy. 
Christ comes into every shadowed corner of our lives with the light of Easter. Christ comes into locked rooms of our faults, and he gifts us with grace and hope. Christ comes to fill us with peace that we may proclaim the good news of mercy and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Christ has come to us. Amen. Descend upon us, O Holy Spirit, to illumine the word of God that in it we might see the truth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. From the very beginning of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, Listen for the word of the Lord. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be apostles set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection. From the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit, by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you, so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, or rather, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith both yours and mine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. So for most of Paul's letters, he was corresponding with churches he had founded and congregations that he had already met with and taught in person. It's not so with his letter to the Romans which of all the letters which scholars kind of attribute undisputedly to Paul, Romans is the only one written to a church that he had not founded. In his introduction to uh, the New Testament, Eugene Boring gives a bit more about the history of the early Roman church to whom Paul writes. So the Christian community in Rome began as messianic believers in 
within the synagogues. So the Roman Jewish community, although sizable, was also largely conscripted to the lower social classes. And despite their efforts not to shake the boat, they weren't viewed with much respect or concern by the empire. And in 49 CE, they were forced to leave the city under a decree made by Emperor Claudius. And this would mean that the Jewish Christian element in the leadership of the churches, the presumably sizable contingent, was forced to leave and that Christian congregations would be composed then primarily of Gentile Christians. Now, when Claudius's decree was rescinded after his death in 54, many of these Jewish Christians returned to Rome, finding that the congregations to which they belonged now had a predominantly Gentile Christian character. Well, following this creedal statement on the lordship of Jesus Christ, he is the Messiah and the Lord, Paul then gives this customary greeting, right? Grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was interested to learn that this twofold greeting of grace and peace is derived from the traditional greetings of Jews and Gentiles. <clears throat> grace, which in Greek is charis, is wordplay on the normal Greek karain, which means greetings. And it's combined with peace or shalom, the normal Hebrew greeting. So there is a strong aim in this letter to affirm and encourage the unity of one church made up of Jewish and Gentile Christians. Which we can see early on in the letter, um, just after this particular portion, he dives right into the wrath of God and <clears throat> all of you guys are miserable sinners, he says. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentiles. And then Along with the universality of sin comes the message of the universality of grace by which all are saved and made holy by God. But before Paul gets into the wrath of God, the wickedness of humanity, he speaks words of gratitude for this congregation that he hardly knows. He tells them how he employs God to make possible a visit that they might be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. Now, as Paul composed this letter to the church in Rome, he was preparing to take an offering to Jerusalem that he had collected over many years from a lot of the other churches to which he had taught and visited. Now, he's hoping that this gift uh, will be symbolic of the unity of Jews and Gentiles in the one church, but he also fears that he and his message and his offering may not be acceptable. As you can see in the 15th chapter of Romans, he is asking for their prayers. It's possible that he fears not even surviving his visit to Jerusalem, and in which case the importance of this letter to the Romans increases as it serves to leave a statement of the Pauline gospel on file in the capital of the Gentile word world, that is Rome. Now, if he does survive Jerusalem, then Rome is his next stop, he tells them, but not his last. Because he then plans to travel on to Spain, which in his world was as far west as you could go. He seeks Rome's encouragement, therefore in part to bolster his nerve for this upcoming visit to Jerusalem about which he holds some fear and trepidation, but also to elicit their support for his Spanish mission. Pray for me that by God's will I may make it safely to you and be refreshed in your company. Now, this is essentially how Paul's letter to the Romans ends. And then he throws in a few personal greetings, 
a closing instruction and then one last doxology. But Paul envisions his time with the Romans to be a spiritual oasis, a place of serving God with joy, growing in faith, a ministry of mutual encouragement. Imagine how wonderful such an oasis would be for an itinerant ministry like Paul's. How wonderful to find a place of mutual encouragement where you can be restored and refreshed by the very gospel you have committed to preach and teach and share and spread. It can be, at times, a dangerous profession. As Jesus' own life, ministry, and crucifixion clearly show. You can be a thankless one. See, again, Jesus chased out of his hometown for preaching in the synagogue there. It can be a discouraging one. See Paul's letter to the Galatians, astonished at how quickly they have deserted the grace of Christ to turn to a different gospel. To find a ministry of mutual encouragement where you often find the people you serve doing a better job demonstrating the love of God than you do. What a beautiful thing. And I may have drifted slightly from Paul's ministry to describing my own here with you at the spiritual oasis that is Ampel Presbyterian Church. And I describe Paul's own itinerant ministry moving from place to place to set up the stage for my own announcement that I will soon be moving on from this pulpit. I informed the session back in January, but did not want to share the news with you until we had made it past Easter, that our focus could be there and on that good news. I assure you, though, as we read through the Gospel of John together leading up to Easter, I felt a unique sting every time Jesus told his disciples, I will not be with you much longer. My current contract expires at the end of this month, which point I plan on taking a few weeks to work on completing my PIF and being able to worship on the other side of a pulpit for the first time in a long while. Um, I ask for your prayers at this time as I step out in faith into a new unknown, but I assure you that I will continue to hold you in every single one of mine. You have indeed taught me so much about serving with joy, about gladly using your gifts, about worshiping authentically and sincerely. Not only have you sustained me financially, but you have sustained me through my own periods of spiritual weakness, of emotional distress. You have shown me much love and encouragement, even when I felt undeserving of it. And in that have borne witness to what I want to call the offensively pervasive nature of God's love, grace, and forgiveness. See, God has zero respect for our own sense of inadequacy and will go right on ahead loving us more than we could possibly ever deserve. I will be moving on from Ant Hill, a much stronger minister and man thanks to the encouragement I have received by your faith. And I pray that my presence as as a teacher and leader among you has opened your eyes to new beauties of God's wondrous love. I pray that you know that you are loved by me and by God. And I especially pray that God would work in the places where my own shortcomings may have caused bruising or soreness to create places of growth and strength out of challenge and conflict. And finally, I pray for all of us on our ongoing journeys, that God would continue to inspire and guide and use us and to strengthen us for the transformation of the church and the world through the mutual encouragement of the faith we share in Jesus Christ. If we made it through last year, we can make it through anything, friends. May his spirit and his love be with you always. And thank you.
Thanks be to God for you. Amen. resurrection, which for, for those who claim Jesus as Lord is a celebration, yes, of, of that, that one day of resurrection, but also a celebration of, of every day, of every breath, of every new possibility that we have to claim life in the name of Jesus Christ and live not only to our fullest, but to God's fullest within us. So as we sing the day of resurrection, let us celebrate a God who keeps promises. Let us rise and sing together. Number 298, the day of resurrection.
same smile on my face when I walk into the sanctuary and realize I just missed the sermon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we continue in unison celebrating our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I ask you Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was he was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we pray. While the Apostle Paul, O oh God, celebrates finding moments of mutual encouragement among your beloved people, that same word mutual could never describe the relationship we have with you and the love and grace with which you shower us. We respond in gratitude, yes, but could never come to match the abundance, the glory, the fullness of your gifts to us. Therefore, we pray that what we gift to you, you would take and you would bless and you would use to create ministries that sustain, to create opportunities for hope, to shine, to create that experience of grace for those in need. And not only bless these gifts that we continue to share and contribute, but bless the hands that give them. May they know the strength they have in you and in giving to your name. May they trust the gifts they have, non-financial, that you have blessed them with to use those to shine your light in your growing kingdom. Take us and use us, O oh God. This is our fervent prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And now we lift to you, O oh God, those prayers we hold in our heart and mind for the presence of your love and care and compassion to work out their way 
in our world, to find the places of need and provide fulfillment, to find those places where there is hunger and thirst and bring satisfaction, to find the places of fear and doubt, to bring your truth and your hope. We especially lift up our brothers and sisters, Lynn and Jim, Mary and Floyd, Joanne and Bobby, and Martha, Kim and Betty. We ask your presence with them in continued health, healing, hope, compassion, be with them and those who love and care for them, that the work of your hands might have many opportunities to touch their lives. We pray this morning for the family of Shannon O'Leary, for her husband, Andy Myers, and for their two children left behind in her tragic death. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those throughout our country and world who are still struggling with sickness, particularly with the COVID-19 disease. We, we ask for hope to continue to find its way in and for those stories of, of healing and the stories of, of health to, to become more and more than the stories of disaster and sickness and contagion. We pray for world leaders, national leaders, local leaders, that your wisdom would find its way into the decisions they make, into the conversations they have, into the, the priorities they set. That your kingdom would seem more reasonable to us. that it would appeal to us, that your love would grow among us, that we would seek out your kingdom in all that we do. And let us celebrate the ways in which your kingdom blossoms through the new leaves on trees, the flowering plants, the reminders of new life, and the promise of new life especially that we celebrate with Megan and Peter as they prepare to become new parents. For my brother John and his wife Amanda as they prepare to become new parents. For all those who are teachers and working with our children and youth, helping them to learn not only the ways of math and science and art, but the ways of love and compassion and friendship. We give thanks the people who touch and shape the lives of our children. And we especially give thanks, O oh God, for your church and for this church here at Ampel Presbyterian Church, the lives that it has touched and shaped and transformed, including my own. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for them, for their faithfulness, for their encouraging ways in this world and for the way that they allow your light to shine brightly. May you continue to strengthen and inspire them, to wrap them in your love, that all that we do and say and work on together might be for your glory, and for the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray for your kingdom, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Friends, let us now rise and sing together our closing hymn in the cross of Christ I glory, number 264. you from this place, uh, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sustenance, the mutual encouragement of that presence of the Holy Spirit that binds us together in unbreakable times. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, to love and serve one another. Shalom. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.